All right, everybody, welcome to this session. This is, um, you know, we're in day three. We're, we're on, this is the, the diehards that decided to stick around and, and they were waiting for this particular session. So um, uh, we're talking about Spiro today. Uh, I have Jeremy McDonald is gonna give us a, an overview of what Spiro is and then give us some activities to play around with and take back to the classroom. Um, Jeremy, want to jump on in and knock it out? I'll jip, jump off. I'll Thanks, Brian. Do something. No awesome. Well, I'm, I'm super excited to be here with everyone today. Um, this has been quite a conference put together uh, by our friends in, in Georgia, the Department of Ed um, and uh, CSTA. So I'm, I'm really um, fortunate that that I can represent Stereo today. Um, apologize for my background. This isn't like some fancy. Uh, uh, Zoom background. This is actually where I am right now. Uh, I'm in my basement, uh, my my unfinished basement, and my wife fondly refers to this space as my nest, um, as opposed to my office. So I've got lots of things around here. You can see I've got a 3D printer back there, and and all sorts of other things uh, among my wife's decorations over here. But super excited, um, and. Excited to take you guys through kind of this beginning journey uh, into Sphero. I know some of you are new to this. Um, and so that's the whole point behind uh, this session is kind of getting you uh, familiar with not only the hardware and, and the software, but also kind of our mission at Sphero. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of background on myself. I'm going to change to uh, my shared screen here. Um, and we are going to go all right um, just in the in the comments there can you let me know if you can see my my screen Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Brian. Um, perfect. Uh, so I'm just going to share some slides here. I'm not going to go full screen because I'm going to be switching back between the app. Um, some of, uh, so I believe Jason asked a moment ago, specific app. Um, so if you go to this link here, edu.sphero.com, um, you're able, uh, sorry, edu.sphero.com slash D for devices. Uh, it'll take you to a quick splash page where you can click on the app store that pertains to your programming device. Um, so one thing we've worked really hard for hard on over the last couple of years is to ensure that we have an app on every device you're going to find in your schools. Um, so from uh, Mac OS for your laptops, uh, iOS for your mobile, your iPhones and iPads, Google Play, Google Chrome Web Store, the Microsoft Web Store, as well as the Amazon App Store. So it's essentially just an Android app, uh, but just running a little bit easier just to allow, uh, to accommodate for the, the hardware that Amazon uses in their in their tablets. But it's there, it shouldn't take you too long to download. It's pretty, pretty quick download. Um, we're working on actually converging all the apps so that it's all gonna look the same on each platform. Today I'm gonna be working from my laptop um, so you'll see the laptop app, it's, it's going to look just like the website does, the edu.sphere.com. Um, but once you get into the programming spaces, uh, every app looks the same. But hopefully we're going to have them all kind of looking the same here very soon. Um, so yeah, if you, can, if you can download that app as I'm talking, I'll get through this in introduction here, and you should be ready to go. If you are on a laptop today, you will need to create an account in order to program. Uh, if you are on a mobile device, you'll you're going to program on a mobile device like your phone or tablet, uh, you can continue as a guest uh, without having an account. That's one of the things we're working on on, on converging and, and making it simpler for everybody uh, to get started, especially get started quickly. So uh, quick little background of myself. So here's a picture of me. I had the opportunity to go to Iceland last year for some promotional work we did for our new uh, Sphero rover, which is pretty awesome. Um, but Prior to working for Sphero, I was in public education for about 13 years. I taught uh, third grade in my very first year. Um, and as far as I know, all those kids have graduated high school, fortunately, so uh, I didn't do too terrible of a job. 
Uh, I then went on to teach fifth grade uh, where I did some dual immersion um, in a split classroom. It was fifth and sixth graders and only my sixth graders were dual immersion, so that was an interesting year. Uh, after that, I taught fifth grade uh, for the rest of my uh, teaching uh, career, and part of that time, I was an instructional coach as well, working with some federal grants uh, to bring greater access to our students um, and into our uh, lower income communities. Then, uh, after that, I went into uh, district administration for about three years, where I was the director of technology uh, and, and innovation for Redmond School District in Central Oregon. Um, and just because some of the work I was doing there, uh, I'd made some contacts with the folks at Sphero, and they had invited me to come out and do what I was doing in my school district, but full time for everyone else around the world. So uh, I've been with Sphero for over three years now, and it's definitely been a different experience working from the private sector um, and seeing uh, education from a different lens, and it's been uh, very beneficial. And I and I continue to uh, champion our teachers around the world, and I appreciate everybody that's taking time, especially this is your summer break, to be here with us today. Um, so we're going to go through. Here's kind of an agenda there on the screen. We have our welcome, and we're jumping into this is the Sphero part. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, please throw them into the chat. Uh, Brian's there to help moderate. Um, and I've been watching a lot of the stuff, and from what I can tell, Brian is an absolutely fantastic um, And then, uh, yeah, and he and I, he or I will help uh, answer those questions as we go through. I have my window up and then the chat over here so that I can see the questions as they come through. Um, but one thing, uh, about Sphero is that we have shifted actually most of our focus from consumer electronics to education. So we're about 90% focus on uh, education and focusing on bringing tools and resources to classrooms around the world um, that spark innovation and allow students to learn about the technologies that surround them. And so we have an approach. We have this cycle that we uh, our approach, our Sphero approach, and it all starts with, at the top there, with meaningful classroom experiences. And so when we start to think of a product or an idea, software, something like that, we always wanna start with the students in mind. Um, in the end, they're the ones that are gonna be using these tools and resources for their learning. Um, and I just wanna make sure, and we wanna make sure that everything we do um, is framing the question of how will students engage, interact, and benefit most uh, importantly, meaningfully from, from our, our resources. And then from there, we, we wanna make sure that our teachers feel supported and engaged. And so we've worked really hard to develop a community around uh, what we do here at Sphero to provide the resources and support that teachers need to further their own learning uh, so that they can be um, even better uh, in their classrooms and, and in their communities. Uh, and then a lot of that, so a lot of what we get information or, or feedback we get from our students and teachers, we begin to put into our software and resources. So a lot of the updates and developments that we have made uh, in Sphere over the last couple of years actually have mostly been suggestions from our community and from our schools. So we're trying to meet the needs that uh, we see that you all are faced with day to day. And then from there, uh, that drives obviously our hardware. Um, Without those other things, our hardware, our robots uh, would just be a really expensive, shiny paperweight, and we don't want that. Uh, we want you to feel that the investment you make in the hardware uh, is not only worth the time you took to look into it, but also the money that you spend, knowing that time and money are very scarce in, in, in education. And so we want to make sure that you get the most out of, of what we're able to do. Um, one thing that we've really worked hard on with Sphero is, is help uh, lower that barrier of entry for schools and students and teachers to begin the, the world of programming, especially programming hardware, not just programming on a screen, but programming hardware to see what actually happens um, in, in a multi-dimensional manner. And so we've worked really hard to keep that barrier of entry low. Uh, there are a lot of other great, great robotics uh, platforms out there, VEX, LEGO, um, all sorts of other ones where you actually get to build your robots, which I think is fantastic. Um, 
but for a lot of our classrooms and for a lot of our new teachers that are being asked to become uh, STEM or STEAM teachers in addition to what they're already doing, uh, it might be a little daunting and a little um, tough for them to really handle the understanding the hardware and the software part at the same time. And so we're trying to focus on, we want to help students and teachers begin the programming uh, journey uh, by building really durable, long-lasting hardware. Um, and as part of that, we, we don't feel that the teachers or even the students have to be experts to get started. And so a lot of the, the, the lessons and activities that we've created, we've done so in a manner that walks you through it step by step until you begin to understand better uh, how the programming works. Um, and in the end, uh, everything we do, we hope, is engaging, challenging, and rewarding uh, for students and teachers alike. Um, and then learning to code, it's kind of the new literacy. So we have, we have uh, numeracy, we have our traditional literacy, reading and writing, and now we have this programming piece that is a big part of, of schools and learning uh, today. Um, and one thing uh, that we work really hard on is making uh, not only our platform, but just the idea of this uh, is that it needs to be more universal and more inclusive. We want more and more people to feel like they can be a part of this programming community. And so that's something we're working towards by ensuring that everybody has not only has access, but feels welcome uh, in these spaces to, to program, to experiment, to, to learn and to play. Uh, the other part of what we're trying to do is, is to enhance computational thinking across the board from our really young learners who are just beginning to recognize that they've kind of always been computational thinkers, um, but putting it in context so they begin to understand how that actually works uh, in the world around them, as well as kind of in that focused learning when we're talking about computer science um, and other related subjects. Um, programming, computer programming itself, uh, is a great facilitator for creativity and innovation. Um, it kind of happens on its own. Uh, just writing a new program from scratch or remixing or uh, refactoring a program is a creative act in itself. And being able to make something, uh, whether it's a sprite jumping across the screen or a robot rolling on the floor, um, those are creative acts that really empower our students. And also, we try to make our make programming and, and, and hardware programming uh, innately collaborative. So we want everybody to be um, working together. So if you notice, if you have a class set of any of our robots, um, or even Little Bits, uh, I don't know if you guys know, Little Bits and Sphere are now the same company. Um, that's a side note. We'll talk about that later. Um, but our class sets aren't designed to be one-to-one. -one. So we don't give you 30, 35 robots to use in the classroom. Uh, you purchase 12 to 15, somewhere around there, because we want students to be working together um, to learn. Um, because really, that's a huge skill that we have to learn today and in any work environment, even from a work from home situation like we're in now, uh, I still have to be collaborative and work with, with, with my peers. And they're all relevant skills. So all of this, whether our students are gonna be computer programmers or not, they're still skills that will benefit them down the road. Um, just being able to understand how things work around them is a benefit uh, to all of us. All right, so the app I mentioned earlier, um, it's on pretty much everything other than Linux. We do have a, 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 our dev app uh, that is Linux based. You are welcome to it if you ask for it, uh, but it, most schools aren't gonna be running uh, Linux labs or things like that uh, when working with our products because it's just so much easier to use the apps and things that we've developed uh, for our robots. And so again, you can find it on pretty much every device you're gonna find in your schools um, that allow you to do three different types of programming. And we're gonna go through some of these here in just a minute. Um, for those of you that have robots with you, fantastic. Because um, that means you get to actually see this firsthand today. And we're going to try and do some troubleshooting if we need to virtually uh, the best we can. But the first one you see there going from left to right is our draw canvas. So right there kind of on that, on that tablet screen, you see a, a different colored star uh, that is drawn by hand, just using your finger as the input or the stylus uh, on the screen. And what that does is we have an algorithm that translates your movements on the screen into JavaScript code. And so it actually takes that uh, movement, the colors, the paths that you create, and converts that into JavaScript, sends it over to the robot, and then the robot recreates that on the ground or whatever surface you have your robot on. So it's a great way to introduce kind of those core concepts, those basics of programming, so that logic, that understanding that it is a, a sequential 
Um, that programming is sequential. Like it's typically a linear uh, progression where you, you start here and you end, end there. And so it's really great to help them see that progression um, just visually by being able to draw. So it's a great introduction there. And then moving over to that middle, uh, looks like a little Chromebook there, I can't tell. Um, but uh, block programming. So block programming has been around for a really, really long time. Um, starting with Scratch, I even go back to the early uh, Lego NXT. Um, I'm trying to think of some other early block programming that's been out there. But uh, block programming isn't something new to the programming world, um, but it might be new to your classroom. And so we have uh, what we feel is an intuitive block programming canvas. It's actually based on Scratch, on the latest version of Scratch. Um, we worked with uh, MIT and, and Scratch on the development of Scratch 3.0. And so we use that essentially as our back end uh, for it. So if you notice the blocks, the, the core shape of the blocks um, are meant to look like Scratch blocks because that's what they're coded with. Uh, but we kind of kept our rounded corners and things like that to stick with our original user interface. But our, our, scratch, our, our blocks also translate um, or transition into text. So you can actually see uh, what uh, the syntax for each, blocks that you're, each block that you use um, in, the, in the appropriate sequence that you would see it in a text editor. And so we have the JavaScript editor as well, uh, which allows you to advance from just the block programming um, to the text editing. And one thing that we're working on, um, I don't think really anybody has found the, the, the silver bullet for this just yet, but um, is making that jump from blocks to text. And so that's what we're working really hard to help students make that uh, conceptual jump from a visual programming environment to just words and letters um, that they may not understand. And so it really is like learning a new language, not just the blocks, but learning JavaScript or Python or Ruby, whatever it is that you're working with. Uh, we need to approach it like learning a new language. And the best way to learn a new language is, into, is to immerse yourself in it and speak that language regularly. And so we're working on, on ways that we can help students make that jump, uh, not just our younger students, but uh, from our work with universities like the Air Force Academy um, and, and, and others. Uh, is that even our older students that might have um, a more readiness, a higher readiness level or a greater aptitude to learn these things still struggle with that um, conceptual jump from blocks to text. Um, uh, Brian just asked about the CS fundamentals, uh, CS foundations. We're actually going to be talking about that kind of towards the second half. So I'll make sure we, we talk and I show you all the resources that are there today. Uh, to make sure that you can take advantage of, of them while they're up and, and available for free. Um, so when it comes to hardware, I know I'm blowing through this really fast. I apologize. You are welcome in the, in the chat to say, hey, slow down, Hot Rod, um, and I'll slow it down. What I'm trying to do is get through kind of this talk about stuff and actually get to the action of making. I know I, I don't have a lot of time with you today, so I want to make sure that you feel that you use your, your time wisely um, and that you learn uh, what you came to learn today. Um, so the robots themselves, um, most of you are going to have something like Bolt, Spark Plus, Mini. Um, some of you may still have the original Spark Edition or the original Sphero 2.0. Um, some of you may have the new Rover. Um, but the 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 maintenance for those robots is, is all very similar. Really, there isn't really any maintenance for them if you have one of our round spherical robots. Um, so whether it's a 2.0, uh, Spark Edition, Spark Plus, or the Bolt, um, those are all waterproof. So the way these are manufactured, you can actually see the seam around your robot. Um, and that seam is where there is an adhesive that actually reacts with the uh, polycarbonate shell that seals it up. And so it is airtight. It is watertight. Um, if you're in um, a lower grade classroom, um, it is everything that's on your students' hands tight, uh, as you might find. And so they're really simple to clean. You can run them under the water uh, in, in, in the sink with some soap and wash them off. You can use uh, disinfecting wipes or a disinfectant to spray and clean them off uh, to keep them clean and sanitized. Um, but you are able to wash these with just about anything without worrying about damaging the robot itself. Um, but because they're also sealed and airtight, they float. So it's a great opportunity to change the medium in which you're programming 
from concrete or linoleum or hardwood uh, to water. Um, we've seen lots of schools like to dip these in paint um, and program uh, different things, whether it's an art project or uh, we've seen a lot of uh, cross-curricular projects where students are, are understanding loops on the programming side by uh, programming specific uh, geometric shapes, polygons, and then using the paint to show that pattern that's created when they loop a polygon, um, which has been really cool. So there's all sorts of things you can do uh, just because they're waterproof. Um, one of the suggestions we have for all of our robots is charge when needed. If you have an older robot like the Spark Edition or, or the Sphero 2.0, you'll probably notice it doesn't stay charged very long. Um, that's an unfortunate reality of rechargeable batteries. Uh, and so we've worked really hard to improve that battery life as we uh, innovate our, with our robots. Bolt currently has the longest battery life um, and capacity of any of our round robots. Uh, Bolt will get you anywhere from two and a half to three and a half hours, sometimes even more out of a single use, which means you're charging it a lot less during the day, which means uh, each time you, you charge it, you use a charge cycle and each robot, each battery, whether it's your phone or whatever rechargeable battery you have, uh, is limited to a specific number of charge cycles. Bolt is right around the 500 range of charge cycles. Um, and so by far, it's the best battery we've been able to develop for our robots, um, but just charge when needed. Uh, obviously, you're not gonna wanna, um, charge it, drain it, and charge it all the time like that. That's not good for any kind of battery. Um, some intermittent charging is, is, is preferred, but also allowing it to charge up and drain. It's battery dynamics are very interesting. Um, no need to label. Uh, so the, uh, our newest robots all have the, the Bluetooth ID printed directly on the robot, or when you actually pull a bolt off of the charger, it will actually scroll the robot's name across the screen there at the top. Um, and distance helps when pairing. Uh, really, when, when connecting a robot, it just, it's all about, I'm gonna open up my app on my phone here, um, and just kind of show you how this works uh, in, a, in a typical space. Um, and then, I mean, drop a Harry Potter reference, so hopefully you all uh, can appreciate that here in just a moment. Um, so holding the robot close like that, uh, it connects and we're done. That's really all it takes is to make sure that they're, they're close and 99% of the time, whichever robot is closest to your programming device is going to be the one at the top of your list when you choose from those robots. Uh, when you have a class set or you have a room full of students and robots, uh, I like to follow what we call our Harry Potter method. So if you're familiar with the first book, um, the Philosopher's Stone, uh, it's where Harry learns that he is uh, an actual wizard. And there's a, a line from there where this gentleman, Hagrid, uh, tells Harry that he's a wizard. Um, but I like to, I changed it a little bit where it says you're a programmer, Harry. And the reason being is uh, we like to say that the robot, the robot chooses the programmer. And the reason we went with that is because in the wizarding world of, of Harry Potter, uh, young witches and wizards do not get to choose their wand. It's actually a pairing process, very similar to pairing a robot with your programming device. Sorting robot, there you go, yeah. We've actually seen some programs like that. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. So uh, if you're familiar with the story, you know, Harry's, they go, Harry goes to uh, the, um, the wand maker, and I, his name uh, slips my mind at the moment, um, but he goes to the wand maker and you, if you watch the scene or you read the book, uh, the wand maker gives him different wands and each wand reacts differently until finally when he gets that last wand, uh, it has this amazing experience. Ollivander, thank you, Ashley. Um, and uh, he has this amazing experience and they're like, all right, that's the one. And so very similar to our robots, you're allowed to uh, kind of do a similar process. And so when you have... A, a case similar to this one here in this in this image. Um, the way we do it is we have students walk up to the case and they will, I'm gonna disconnect. You walk up to the case, they tap on connect to robot and a list of robots will appear. And in this case, I don't have my power pack here. So normally there would be 15 robots on this list. All they need to do is tap on the very top robot and they wait to see which one lights up. Whichever one lights up is the robot that has chosen them 
they take that robot and they're able to go back to their seat or back to their group to begin their work. And this is the e by far the easiest way to get robots. We've done this in the past with um, even some of our older robots and, and it works really, really well. Um, I always refer back to one session where uh, I didn't have any troubleshooting issues. That was probably the greatest teaching day of my life uh, <laughs> working with Sphero where we had close to 80 teachers uh, pair robots in this really big room. There was about 140 teachers, um, but we had about 80 teachers pair robots in right around 10 minutes, um, really without any significant issues. So it all happens, and I know that's different for every classroom, especially with, depending on the devices you're using and the amount of Bluetooth and Wi-Fi traffic. But that is our Harry Potter method. Uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, you can see some videos that kind of demonstrate that Harry Potter method as well. Um, but yeah, so what I want to do is I want to jump into some programming. I would like to take you on a tour of the Sphero EDU app, um, show you some basics. Um, I'll touch on uh, Brian's comments on the CS foundations that is available currently. Um, that is, and then I'll go more deep into that towards the end. But let's get programming and uh, see if you have any questions along the way. So I'm in trade screens here now. Uh, so I have the Sphero EDU app. This is just the the laptop app, so it's the same on a MacBook, on a Windows 10 machine, or on a Chromebook. Um, but when you're here, uh, generally you're gonna be brought to this getting started page. Uh, if you don't need it anymore, we have a checkbox that allows you to check, and so that it doesn't default to this getting started page every time. Uh, just a few getting started tips um, that we have here, including some videos and some gifts, to just kind of help you uh, get through that process. And then we have a specific one that's just for educators uh, that helps you uh, understand uh, the class creation process uh, with some videos and some GIFs as well um, that kind of takes you through that. I will let you look through that on your own um, after we're done here today. But you're always able to reach out to any of us at, at our team. So education at Sphero.com uh, will reach our entire team. Uh, if you would like to reach out to me, I've set up a, an email address. It's pretty simple to remember, and it is jmac at sphero.com. So I'm going to add uh, edu.sphero.com. So Jason, that is um, this is actually our app. It's also the website edu.sphero.com. If you go there, um, you should see the getting started information uh, when you first go to that page. Um, and then I'm going to add a couple email addresses here so you all can reach out to us at any time with any questions. So like I said, uh, education at Sphero.com. And then if you want to reach me personally for whatever reason, uh, the majority of my job is to develop content, and I used to in a, in a pre-COVID world, travel quite a bit to work with, with schools. Um, but right now I'm just focusing on developing content and resources. Um, but if you need to connect with me about anything, I'm happy to help. That's a big part of my job is, is talking to teachers. So jmac at sphero.com. Um, so you can reach out to that email address as well. I'm pretty good about getting back uh, to folks that reach out within, usually within the day. Um, so don't be surprised if you get an email that I sent like at 11.30 at night because that's usually when I'm answering uh, most, most emails. Um, so let's get programming. So from here, there are, you'll notice some, uh, I guess we'll call them tabs, for the lack of a better word, at the top of my screen here. We have home, uh, activities, programs, classes, drive, and then just your account uh, profile here. Down below, you have QR, a QR code scanner, as well as the where you would normally pair your robot. Uh, I've already got one paired, so we're ready to go. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and click on the home. So when I click, Oops. So when I have Rover Home, there's a couple things. So there's the feed. This is just things that we've done in Sphero. This used to be different. We're working on it. Uh, we're not sure how long we're going to keep the feed. Um, so that's why it's not the home screen anymore. Uh, but we have 3D models of all of our robots. Um, so this is super cool because it allows you to see what we call an exploded view of each of our robots. Um, it doesn't want to be. All right, well, there we go, kind of.
All right, so I invite you to check those out later. I don't know if it's a if it's a bandwidth issue or if it's just a an issue on <coughs> too much running on my laptop right now. I apologize for that, but they're there in the app. You're able to view them and, and see those uh, exploded views of each of our robots. And then um, we have our activities. So activities or lessons, whatever you want to call them. Originally, they've been called activities from the very beginning of Sphero's introduction to education. Um, whereas now, with a lot of our work with little bits, we're calling them lessons. So for us, it's an interchangeable um, word or set of words. Uh, but when you come here, when you come to activities, it brings you to kind of the home screen of all of our activities. And right now, uh, the ones by Sphero are always going to be the ones that we feature that we want you to see first uh, from ours that we've created. And then when you scroll down a little bit, we have our community. And these are all uh, posted based on uh, their approval date. So when you see them here, it's, it's the most recent activities that have been published by um, teachers from around the world. So we work really hard to ensure that these activities are vetted um, on a number of different levels. Uh, every now and then, um, one squeaks through that really doesn't have much of any substance to it. And we apologize for that. But what we try to make sure is that each of the activities that are here can be a benefit not only to the teacher's class that created the activity, but to someone else as well. And so there's activities, um, thousands of activities created by teachers from around the world, um, as well as hundreds of activities created by us at Sphero. Um, we have some quick search buttons at the top for grade level and some specific uh, subject areas. Uh, but when you click on the little filter icon, the little funnel up there, you can search by activities that are designed specifically for certain robots. Um, when I search, I generally don't click on this because a lot of the activities um, can work with all of our robots. Um, you can filter by quite a few things here. Uh, first is things you've liked. So when you click on the little heart, it's a like, and you're able to go back and search by, the, by just what you've clicked um, on. You can search by things you've made. You can search by things that Sphero has made. And then all of these things down here, these are actually all teachers uh, or students that we've created um, in, in various test accounts. And so you technically can search for your students as well. Um, and then sort by date newest and oldest, and then also even most likes. So you can see what is most popular, uh, what people are, are using the most um, or seem to like the most. You can search by specific grade range. The reason we did a grade range was because, you know, sometimes if you look at third grade science and on up to fifth grade science, really the only difference between those three years is that the books get thicker and they go more in depth on the concepts, but they cover a lot of the same things. And so uh, we give you the option to search by a grade range as opposed to searching for a single grade level. Um, and then you have duration. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then tags. We have curated our tag list here um, just simply to avoid uh, repetition, misspellings, things like that. So if there ever is a tag that you would like to add, maybe it's your district name or, or abbreviation, um, or there's just a tag that you think is more relevant to some of the things you're doing, let us know. We actually add the tag. It takes about five minutes for our system to recognize it and then populate it in, back into the app. Um, but we try and keep that nice and clean and useful. Um, and so you're able to sort by the various tags. Uh, you can sort by specific education standards. You probably aren't going to see all of your states there. We're working on that. Uh, we're working to improve that, um, as well as some international standards um, from specific subject areas and, again, grade ranges. And then we have uh, languages. Um, so this is going to be the language that the activity was written in. Um, our apps uh, use essentially a version of Google Translate that helps us translate um, a certain portion of the app that we haven't translated ourselves. But these, I believe it's like 14 languages or more, we've worked with translation companies to help us translate um, our work so that it's accessible by more language, uh, by different language speakers from around the world. And then we have Reset that just clears your search so you're able to find it again. Most popular search function is just to type in a keyword and look for something that way as well. Uh, Jason asks about the complimentary access uh, for our uh, CS foundations. Um, I do believe uh, in 
either at the beginning of July or the end of July. Um, I need to check. Um, I can actually send a Slack message real quick and find out uh, why we're sitting here. That way we can get an answer to you all today. Um, so one thing, I'm gonna tell you a little secret that you can do. So while you can't actually copy a, a program that you didn't make, um, like duplicate it, um, you can just copy and paste function on every computer and every browser. Um, so if there's lessons on here that you really would like to try, um, come back to school. Uh, I didn't tell you, but copy and paste always works. Um, so let's get into programming. So over here under programs, we have uh, all programs, my programs, and then our JavaScript wiki. To access the JavaScript wiki, unfortunately, you do need to be connected to the internet because it is a separate site. Um, it is not built into the app. Uh, again, we're working on streamlining a lot of those things. But what's nice about the JavaScript wiki, I'm gonna go ahead and open that up and bring the page over here so you can see it, is it's not just for JavaScript. Um, but uh, really well is what each block does and so when you come to the site it'll actually give you an image of the block itself and then a description of that block as well as the JavaScript command to actually write the code for that block and so it we spent a lot of time with with our software and firmware developers to make sure not only is this accurate but it's also in a language that is gonna help um, our non-programmers are, are folks that are maybe new uh, to understand how how this works. Um, so not in a super technical language, um, but there are still parts that are way over my head. So um, we, we did what we could, we did the best we can to make sure that everybody can understand it uh, to the best of their abilities. Um, but when I hover back over, over programs, I'm just gonna go to create right now. Um, and it is going to pull up uh, the new program screen. And so here, is you're going to need to give your program a name. So if any of you are using any type of cloud storage like Google or, or, or OneDrive, um, you probably have a lot of documents that are titled untitled, and it makes it really difficult to go back and find what you're looking for. And unfortunately, uh, in our app, if you don't title it, it just gives it the name untitled program, which then makes it hard for you to find what you were working on previously. So I always suggest uh, giving it a name um, or at least the date which is simple, just enter a few numbers so that you know when you worked on it so you can go back and find it again easier. So I'm just gonna do, um, type in the word stars because constellations are made up of stars. Um, and I'm gonna type in today's date, which is uh, 617. So I'm just gonna do 617 like so. So that lets me know this was during the constellation conference and then it was today on the 17th. Um, let's take a look at draw. So I'm gonna select the draw programming canvas and then because my robot is already connected, it defaults to the robot that's connected. If you don't have a robot connected, it will default to Sphero. Um, but as you can see, you can actually select all these robots there. That's not necessary if you're not using all those robots, but certain robots do have specific coding capabilities that the rest of the robots don't have. So for example, our Star Wars robots that are programmable, they have certain sounds and animations that are only available on those on those robots that's per our uh, original contract with Lucas and, and Disney. And so we can't put BB-8 noises on a, on a Bolt, unfortunately. Uh, but Bolt having other sensors and capabilities that the Sphero, the Spark Plus, or the uh, Spark Edition don't have, Bolt has specific uh, blocks and program programmability that the other robots don't have. So you wanna make sure that you choose the robot that's gonna work best uh, for your program. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and click create. Now, before we jump in and begin to draw here, uh, is there anyone that hasn't connected a robot to their device? Just so we can do a little quick troubleshooting, make sure everybody has a chance to connect their robots. If you need to get okay. on the screen and, and ask your question in person, let me know and I can give you access so you can talk.
guess we're pretty good. Okay, that works. Thanks for checking in, Brian. Appreciate it. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, the draw canvas is just that. All you're going to do is draw um, using your hand. Um, no, Jason, you don't have to be, uh, you do not need to be connected to a robot to program. To run your program, you do because you need that robot to execute the code. But to create a program, you do not have to have a robot connected. That's a great question. So uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. Um, since I'm using my laptop, I've got a trackpad right here next to me. Um, a lot of students uh, have access to Chromebooks, um, things like that. One of the suggestions I give that allow them to draw a little bit, um, I guess, more freely uh, or more intuitively, because um, it's kind of tough to draw with a mouse. Um, it might be tough to push all the way down the trackpad and then move your finger around, is to use both hands. And so what I always say is, is use your non-dominant hand to essentially engage the trackpad, like push down on it um, or push on the button. And then once you've done that, you use your dominant hand that you normally would draw with to actually do the movements on it. So now you can actually more freely move your hand like you're touching a, a tablet screen or something like that. That then allows you to draw on the screen. Now that's a bunch of squiggles. Um, that doesn't look like much, but my bolt right now that's connected would do its best to actually recreate all those squiggles by moving around on the ground uh, to, to, to replicate that pattern. <clears throat> and when I go up here to the three dots, the top right corner, that's called the overflow. So instead of having a whole bunch of icons across the screen, we just have the most important ones uh, out ready to be used. And then the extras we keep behind the overflow. So we have sensor data, JavaScript code, and then a draw canvas help. What I want to look at is the JavaScript code. So you see here, we have a lot of roll commands here. And the reason being is it actually, if you look closely at your drawing, I don't know if you can zoom in on my screen. Um, if you look closely, uh, that all those lines are broken up into small segments. So that's part of the algorithm that we use. And each of those segments is its own line of code. And then that creates that movement um, for, for your robot. Uh, down at the bottom right, you're able to undo. So I'm going to go and tap on undo, clear off my screen. Um, because this is actually translating directly to code, you can't erase sections, because what that would mean is then it would have to rewrite the code in real time while it's trying to capture what it was previously and make the new code. So we haven't found a way to do that uh, very intuitively for, for the, the program itself. Um, and then over here on the left corner, we have a, a color wheel. So this allows you to actually change the color of the lines that you're drawing with, which then translates to what the color of your robot will be while it's moving around. So whether it's it's bolt with the matrix, it's gonna change that matrix color to whatever you choose um, to draw with. Or if you're using a Spark Plus, um, Spark Edition or Sphero 2.0, the two top LED lights will illuminate to that color to match. And so when I, click on those colors and then allows me to draw with that specific color. But if you notice over here on the right, we have this speed slider here. This changes the, the speed of your robot. Um, so obviously all the way to the top is full speed, all the way to the bottom is no speed and everything else in between. But what you will notice, I'm gonna change the color here so it's a little bit more obvious, is when you change that speed, the thickness of the line also changes. And so that's full speed. And I'm gonna go down here, click back to kind of a slower speed. I'm gonna go to blue and I'm gonna draw another line. And what you're gonna notice is that line is a lot thinner. So it's not nearly as thick as the line, the green line. And that's also a great visual cue to help students see that they've actually changed the code of their program just by changing the color or by changing the speed uh, at which they want a, the robot to roll. And so that's a great introduction to manipulating the code, um, sending a command, so to speak, to change the speed or change the color. Um, so what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna go kind of to a middle level speed here. I'm going to, to get out of the color wheel and the speed, unfortunately there is uh, a little arrow, like a little carrot over on the far left that you have to click to get rid of it. Um, a lot of people just try to click off and, t and tap on the screen and what that does is it leaves marks. And so your robot sees that mark and it thinks it needs to be 
recreated. So it'll actually move to those different marks. Um, so I'm going to actually clean the screen off here by just undoing. But what I want us to do, those of you that have your robots connected, ready to go, is I'm going to draw a square by not lifting up my hand. I'm going to—it's going to be one continuous uh, series of lines to create that square, and then we'll do it another way so I can kind of show you that idea of understanding how the logic uh, is sequenced and, and help students understand that. So I'm going to go ahead and draw as best I can. Oops, see, it gets a little crazy there using a trackpad. Um, and up. So, not the prettiest square. Um, and if you were to draw something similar, you'll actually see your robot do some wiggles and shakes as it tries to replicate some of those uh, crooked lines or weird corners that, that, that you draw. Because um, again, it's doing its best to recreate um, the drawing. Uh, so, once it's done, um, we always aim our robot. So when you, uh-oh, so my robot doesn't seem to want to work. So I'm going to connect to a different one. So bear with me for a second. Sorry. Connect here. I'm going to sleep the other robot. There we go. I'm going to connect to robot. It's going to bring up the list of the last robot type of robot I tried to connect to, which was Bolt. I'm going to go ahead and select that Bolt. There we go. And we're connected here. So now I can go back into view my program. Okay. So we're back to my, my wonky square. Uh, if you click on aim at the top of your screen, whether you're on uh, a tablet or a laptop, um, it's going to bring up something similar to this. If you're on a tablet, uh, it's just going to have a, a wheel with a little dot on it, and you just move that dot around. And so if you look at my robot here, as I move the arrow keys, you see that blue light, which we call the tail light, rotate around. Um, and that is how you set the aim. And so we always like to say that the tail needs to point at the programmer. So if you're standing behind the robot, which most students will be when they run their program, um, that that light needs to point back to the programmer because that means uh, that it's going to move directly away from them. And the reason we did it as a tail as opposed to a nose is because most kids are going to be sitting down on the ground. Uh, we've noticed when when programming, and so if it were to be the nose of the robot, it it would take an extra effort to get around or to see that nose. Whereas if they can see the tail from sitting down, that helps orient it. It's actually setting the 180 degree mark so that the nose then is at the zero degree mark and it will begin to roll away from them um, depending on the program. But once you've aimed your robot, um, go ahead and set it on the ground somewhere and uh, push start at the top of your screen and watch it roll and it, see what comments or, or any questions you have after running your first draw program. Let's see if I can get, can't really see much of, my floor here. I was going to try and the camera's not all that great. So does anybody have a camera that they can uh, position so we can see their robot turn corners? just my desk here and probably can get a, a little program. All right, so I have mine there. I'm going to go ahead and aim it. So like I was saying earlier, it's always best to have the robot pointed um, at the programmer when starting. So I cleared my screen off and I went ahead and uh, just drew a simple line. And when I hit start now, my robot's going to turn the color of that line and then it's going to travel that direction so one thing you'll notice is that the the draw canvas has a grid um originally we wanted to use the grid to create a sort of scale that allows you to say okay one square on the screen is equal to one square on the ground um unfortunately that's different just because of each robot uh the power each motor has in each robot uh, the surface you're on, so the friction coefficient is different. 
And then based on the robot itself and its contact with the floor, it changes so often that it was really hard for us to create a consistent scale. Now that said, uh, according to the science of Jeremy, myself, um, and having done this so often, on a typical iPad screen or Chromebook screen, one of those squares on your screen is about 11 to 14 inches on the ground. Um, and, I, and I give it that plus or minus kind of three inch range uh, just because again, so many things can change, but I've noticed you kind of get that almost one square foot. Um, but that's a great opportunity for students to kind of work on understanding ratios and, and, and build that uh, comparison themselves when working in the draw canvas. Um, now what I wanted to explain is, is when you, when I ran that, if I were to run that square program, Bolt would have, from where I started, it would have gone over one way, it would have moved down, moved the other way, and then back up to complete the square, because that's the order in which I drew my square. Now, I'm going to draw a square on my screen here, but it may not be in the correct order. So let's say I go with that same line across the top, but instead of continuing down, I'm actually going to come back over here and I'm going to draw this side. And then I want to draw this side. And then I'm going to draw my final side. So I still drew a square. It actually looks better than my first one. But what the program is seeing, though, is each one of those lines is a set of code. And so because I drew that first line at the top first, it'll execute that line of code. And then it's going to go to the starting point of that other line and then draw that up line. And so when this would be all done, it's just going to be a mess of lines as opposed to an actual square that you tried to draw. Um, so that helps with understanding sequencing from the get-go. Now, the draw canvas might seem a little too elementary or too young for a lot of uh, older, maybe beginning programmers, but it's a great way to begin that process of, of understanding sequencing uh, in a programming environment. Now let's go ahead and take a look at blocks. So up in the top left, there's an, a back arrow. You go and tap on or click on, and it's going to bring you back to um, uh, to the pro original program screen. Um, you can go back, and it should bring you back to your other programs. Or if you go to My Programs, um, down at the bottom, if you're on a tablet, uh, you'll be able to see. Um, all the programs you've made. Um, so here's all the programs that are in development or have been made by us here at Sphero. Um, but back at the top, um, if you go to programs, my programs, or on a tablet or a phone, it's gonna be at the bottom. Um, whoops, I wanna go to create. So we're gonna create a new program again. And this one's gonna be a blocks. So I'm gonna call this one stars blocks 617 because again, name your programs, it's just a good habit to get into. That way I know after this, if I don't need these programs, I can go ahead and delete them. Um, I'm one of those folks that I don't like to have a lot of stuff in my digital spaces, so I like to keep them clean and use the thing and have what I need uh, uh, right at the front. So I'm gonna go ahead and click Create. And so now it's gonna open up our uh, block canvas. So if you notice, the grid is gone. There's no more grid here because we're not drawing. Uh, the grid is still there in the draw canvas to kind of give you a point of reference that helps students go from maybe an intersection to an intersection or to draw uh, more accurate polygons and things like that. But once you're here, you're gonna notice that you have that first block there on start. You're able to move your canvas around. Um, you can also zoom in, so pinch to zoom kind of thing. Uh, if you're having trouble seeing, seeing it on your screen, um, that's always helpful to, to zoom in. And then down at the bottom, you're going to see these colored tabs. And they look like those binder tabs you had to have in school, you know, to organize all your different classes. You may still use them now. Um, and each color represents a different type of programming command as it relates to a Sphero robot. And so the very first one is kind of this turquoise uh, light blue color. And it's called movements. And so what this one does is it controls everything that has to do with the motors. So it will, uh, that includes aiming your robot um, or resetting the aim, I should say, at some point during the program uh, because those motors are what controls that feature. 
Then we have lights. This is anything to do with uh, the LED lights that are built into your robot. Sounds. Uh, so one question we get a lot from folks is, does the robot make the sound? No, it does not. The sound actually comes from your programming device. So make sure the volume's up, the mute buttons are turned off so that you can hear the sounds that you program into, into each of your programs. Then we have controls. This is where we get into um, some of our, this is where we get into conditional logic. So if then or if then else, as well as our loops. So we have for loops and while loops um, here, as well as a delay block and an exit program block. Uh, then you jump into operators. So this is all of your mathematical um, functions that you will use within your program. Then we have uh, our comparators. So this is just where you're looking at your standard mathematical comparisons, so your equals, not equals, greater than or less than. And then you have your Boolean comparators. So this is your uh, and, same, different, all those kinds of things. And then you also have an opportunity to create a program that's actually uh, includes multiple robots. So depending on which robots connected, it would execute a different part of that program using this uh, comparator. And then we have our sensor blocks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Each of these uh, are what you use to capture specific data um, from the various sensors in the robots. Now, I, I apologize. I did not go over the sensors in the robots. Uh, so in your in a Spark Plus, Spark 2.0, Spark Edition, your Sphero Mini, uh, those all have our IMU. And so that uh, integrated measurement unit is typically uh, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. Uh, in our robots, we created our own IMU, and it just has the accelerometer and gyroscope uh, in most of those robots. And so if you're not familiar with what those are, a gyroscope is, is what measures uh, the speed the rotation and the and the rate of rotation on the on three different axes, and so uh, if this robot sitting there stable, uh, the z-axis is up and down, and then you have your y and your and your x, and so the yaw is just spinning on its z-axis like that, and so that's measuring the degree of change plus the rate of rate of change, and then you have your uh, roll which is tilting left and right, like so. And then you have your pitch, which is up and back like that. So think of an airplane taking off or landing or airplane turning, something like that. And then, excuse me, <clears throat> and then you have your accelerometer. So an accelerometer measures any change or delta in acceleration. Um, and we use G-forces to, uh, essentially to, I guess, to explain that change in acceleration. And so think of it as kind of, the the points of a fork i know there's a special name i can't think of it at the moment um and then they're really close together but on a very small microscopic level and as that robot shifts or as that accelerometer shifts those um parts will touch um and it and based on how they touch the 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 change in their acceleration will will calculate the change in acceleration for the robot um, so you're able to actually capture that data or create conditional program based on that data. Then you have Bolt and Rover, which also includes infrared. And so that is a uh, communication signal uh, or radio wave that is sent um, between robots that allows you to uh, also create conditional programming. It's what I like to call quasi-swarm robotics, where you're able to have robots communicate with one another and work with each other. Uh, the reason I say quasi is because true swarm robotics is you have a primary uh, control center um, or mothership, so to speak, that controls all the robots at once. Whereas with our robots, each robot needs its own programming device in order to function properly. Um, and then uh, the rover and the bolt also have what's called an ambient light sensor. So it's actually able to measure the illuminance in its, in its environment. And so what that does is it actually it actually counts the number of photons bouncing off of the sensor itself um, over a given period of time. And it translates that actually to an electric pulse that is measured in a value called lux. And that lux value is then used uh, to create the conditional programming uh, around that. So you could create programs where you could say, hey, when the lights turn on, the robot moves, or when the lights turn off, the robot moves, whatever you wanna do, things like that. Um, so those are the sensors and you're able to actually collect that data. And I'll show you something here in a minute. Um, on how that works, and then communications. So those of you that have 
Bolt or Rover. Uh, that is for the infrared uh, communication between robots. We then have events. So events are uh, pre-programmed conditionals, essentially. So for example, uh, one of the more common ones is on collision. So essentially, it's, it's an algorithm that's already built in that you just drag the block on that says, hey, when my robot bumps into something, it needs to say, ouch, or it needs to light up, or it needs to roll backwards, whatever it is you want to do. And what's great about the event blocks is, is it has um, dynamic uh, code. So if your robot's sitting still and you have on collision programmed, it's not going to take a whole lot for that accelerometer to recognize a collision, so to speak. Whereas if your robot's rolling uh, at a moderate pace, you know, somewhere around maybe um, a half a foot a second, something like that, um, it will recognize that collision on what by a specific amount of change in acceleration. So if you're going faster, it's obviously gonna be a much greater change in acceleration, whereas if you're going slower, it's gonna recognize a much smaller change in acceleration. Um, and then we have uh, our variables. So variables is just, uh, uh, it stores data that you can then move throughout your program uh, based on, on the logic and then your functions. So if you're not familiar with functions, think of a function of, as a program inside of a program. So sometimes you write a whole bunch of code that might be repeated throughout your program, and maybe you don't want to have to add that code every single time. So what you do is you write it once, and you create it as a function, and then you drag that function block into your code throughout so you're not having to rewrite or remake that code each time. So let's go ahead and make something here uh, with our, our uh, block canvas. I'm not going to do uh, movements per se right now because what I wanna be able to do is demonstrate how it works. And a lot of folks um, are really interested in how the sensors and the data collection works. And so I'm gonna do a program with you, um, if you wanna follow along, that allows you to use that, uh, the sensor, that sensor data for conditional programming. Is everyone good? We have about 10 minutes left, and I think I wanna get uh, through this program real quick, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, Computer Science Foundations. All right, so real quick, I'm gonna show you this program if you wanna follow along, have your device ready to go. Um, the first thing we need to do on this program that we're gonna do is we're gonna actually turn stabilization off. So if your robot is paired with your device, you'll notice that it does not like to be upside down. So as I try and flip this upside down, the gyroscope says, hey, nope, can't, nope, can't. I wanna be right side up. So we wanna turn that off for this particular program. So under movements, there's a stabilization block and I'm gonna click on off to turn that off here and then what we're going to do is we're going to go to control so now we need to add a loop because we just want this to be continually looping and so i'm just going to use a loop forever or a while loop and that's going to be the basis of our program now inside of that loop we need to create a condition if this happens then we want this to happen so i'm going to actually just use the if then else block here and i'm going to drop that right inside of the loop forever now we need to compare something. And in this case, uh, we're gonna compare a sensor value to a set threshold. So I'm gonna take that first comparator block. Whoops, there it is. And I'm gonna drop it right inside where it says true. And what we're gonna use is we're gonna use the accelerometer. So if you go to sensors, the very first block there is the accelerometer. And this is gonna measure any change in acceleration. So essentially it's gonna require a shake or a toss or a catch for this for the for the um, conditional to trigger. I'm gonna place that in the first space there. So now it's saying we want to measure the total change in acceleration, and we want to see if it's greater than. We're just gonna do greater than, and in this case we're gonna keep it pretty simple. So I'm gonna say two. So that's two g forces or two units of gravity. Um, so it's gonna experience more than that in order for it to trigger the condition. If that's the case, if we shake it or move it um, at a change greater than two Gs, um, let's have it light up and make a sound. So the first thing we're gonna do is I'm going to have, I'm gonna bring this main LED here and I'm gonna have mine light up to blue. because That's one of my favorite colors. Um, and then we're gonna have it make a sound. And I'm gonna go to sounds and go to play rent or grab the play sound block 
And when you click on random, you're going to see this list of all these different categories of sounds. There's like 350 sounds there. Um, you could spend all day trying to learn them all. Um, I usually use 8-bit because they're kind of those traditional video game sounds. And they're short and easy to recognize. So I'm going to do blip. You may have heard that. Um, and right here is wait or continue. So this is where the async JavaScript programming comes in. If I say wait, I just want the sound to play before it moves on to the next part of the code. If I click continue, it's going to start the sound and immediately jump to the next line of code. I'm going to leave it at wait, but I'm also going to add a delay here because I want to make sure that I see the light change uh, before it goes through. And I'm just going to do it for one second. So that just means that light's going to stay on just a little bit longer so I know that it recognized the shake. Now, the else part is if it's not being if the accelerometer is not recognizing a change greater than two, we want it to do something. In this case, I'm just going to have it turn the light off. And so to do that, you add a main LED block. And at the very bottom, there's a brightness slider. And if you bring that all the way over to the left, it will turn that light off. So there's no light at all. So now, when I run my program, I'm going to hit start. You're going to notice there's no light on at all because it's not recognizing any change in acceleration. Now I can give it a little shake and it's not more than two Gs just yet, but when I give it a good shake, you can hear the sound and the light turns on. There we go. So this is actually based on one of the activities we have uh, in Sphero EDU and it's um, called Blocks 2. And what it does is you're able to create a game we call Animal Toss. So instead of a, a blip sound, it plays a random animal sound. And as you toss it around to the students and they catch it, it plays that animal sound. And then each student has to name that animal they hear. Um, and if they don't, they have to act out the animal. Silly, fun little kind of icebreaker game. I know how we all love icebreakers, right? Um, so that's just building a basic block program. And again, like I said earlier, if you go up to the overflow, you're able to see the JavaScript code. So there it is, just a handful of lines uh, of JavaScript code um, that the blocks are representing at this time. Um, are there any quick questions, any questions around the blocks real quick before I dive back into the, the activities and, and talk to you a little bit about CSF before we leave here? Don't see any right now, uh, Jeremy, and we're running pretty close up on time. So let's jump into yeah. it. Thanks. Yep. Oh, well, there's a, there's a okay. question. What is the light sensor block? Light sensor block. Oh, so that's the, uh, it's called luminous, luminosity. I don't know why we named it luminosity. I have asked it to be changed to luminance because that's what it's actually measuring. But uh, under sensors, it is called luminosity. It's that block right there. So you would actually be able to add that if you took accelerometer out and added luminosity, and you could change the lux value here to something like 300. So when it experiences a lux value greater than 300, the light comes on and it makes the sound. Uh, to give you a frame of reference, if you go outside and it's sunny, you're looking at anywhere from 10 to 30,000 lux, uh, whereas inside a bright uh, kind of fluorescent light room, you're looking right around anywhere from four to 700 bucks. All right, so I'm gonna switch back to the presentation real quick so I can talk about Computer Science Foundations, which uh, I have been told should be available through July, through the end of July. Um, this is our first effort into paid content. Um, our, we build our robots and we want them to last as long as possible, but we have to, try to generate some revenue for the company uh, so we can continue our innovation in between those purchases of robots. And this was our first effort at something like that. And so we worked with uh, a partner to develop some really rich and robust um, computer science uh, supplemental curriculum. This is not meant to be a standalone. It's meant to help aid uh, in the area of teaching a lot of your general ed subjects like math, uh, science, language arts, art, history, um, things like that, but with uh, a bit of that CS um, computer programming twist. 
Um, and so what C, uh, CS Foundations is, 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 is just that, our first effort to develop a supplemental curriculum for uh, kind of grades three through eight. Um, it can be used with lower grades. The reason we say three through eight is because uh, it requires reading. And we want to ensure that the students that are, are doing this have the literacy uh, readiness to, 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 to be successful. But if you have young readers that are, are able to, to benefit from this, by all means, um, you can use it in lower grades. And here on my screen, you have kind of the, the breakdown, the scope and sequence of all the lessons. So there's three units. Um, and each unit is divided into themes as opposed to, to uh, subject areas, because we want this to be as flexible as possible. So the first theme we have is shapes and numbers. So obviously we're looking at, at uh, math in a lot of this. Uh, we have the A in STEAM, so this is all art focus. And then we have nature, which is more of your biology. Uh, then we have empathy, um, something we're working on again, making this inclusive and universals. We wanna make sure we're also bringing in uh, ways to understand empathy and, and connect with others. We have game design and storytelling. Um, and then in the final course, which is kind of our advanced levels, this is where you're actually doing quite a bit of JavaScript programming. We have navigation, missions, and brain breakers. And uh, if you look, it breaks it down um, from a very beginning standpoint down to a more advanced. Um, and each of the uh, themes are broken up by um, readiness levels. So whether we're looking at uh, draw or beginning blocks, or we're looking at uh, advanced blocks and a text transition all the way to JavaScript. Um, and so it's broken down to three courses. Each course has its own physical teacher's guide, teacher's manual that allows you to um, prepare beforehand. But everything that's in the teacher's guide is also generally in the app itself under the teacher tips, educator tips for students. Um, since I don't have a lot more time, um, what I will do is if you go on to our, the app right now um, and go to activities, uh, you can see all of these that we have uh, out. And so this is essentially the first two courses are available for free right now. Unfortunately, they will be pulling these back uh, sometime in July, probably the end of July. Um, but like I mentioned, you know, copy and paste, try and figure out if these are gonna be useful to you in your, in your school district. Um, but here's all the different ones that are available. Um, all the way up into some uh, JavaScript transition lessons, um, but also the very beginning ones like uh, shapes and numbers and things like that. Um, what's great about them when you go in is you have, let me go and click start activity. And the reason I do that is because you're actually able to see the programming canvas along with the lesson together. And so in this activity, you're actually gonna be creating a program and then on, on, the, on the side of the screen there, you have the steps for that, as well as a visual of the programming blocks that you're going to be using. And then that allows you to create your program while being able to have the student walk through the lesson as in a group or independently. And it walks them through that. Uh, and, and then um, it also has the GIFs that allow you to see uh, some of those blocks being moved. Um, if you have an educator account, you'll see these educator tips. These are the things that typically show up in the teacher's manual. Um, so don't fret if you don't have a teacher's manual while you begin to use this. Um, but the educator tips essentially is what you're gonna see in the teacher's manual. We just heard from a lot of our teachers that they want something physical to be able to open and prepare with. Um, so something, something static or analog, so to speak, while they're working in the digital as well. So um, if, Pricing and things like that. Uh, right now, it's on a yearly license. We're moving to a perpetual license. Uh, it's by uh, unit, so it's $199. That's unlimited seats for your students. So if you're a middle school librarian and you see everybody in your school, you have enough licenses, essentially, with that one price for everybody in your school. Um, but I appreciate it. I know we're out of time. i really, really glad you all were here with me today. Um, hopefully, you found something useful you can take back with you. Go back further up in the chat and find my email address. You can reach out to me anytime. Um, I wanna be here to help you uh, with anything. Um, so again, there's no question too hard. Um, I'll do my best to make sure that you all have the resources you need to be successful. Jeremy, 
Thank you tremendously. Um, like I said, I, I learned a lot and, you know, I don't have a classroom, but I miss having classroom because of sessions like this. I get to play around the toys again and, and use them. Um, and I know that several of the people that are here are, are the target audience that I was trying to get to folks that had spheros in their classrooms and, and didn't have access or didn't have a background on how to use them and employ them. So, um, thank you for, for the session. I appreciate it. Of course. Um, everybody, we have another break. We come back at 2.45 for another set of panels. Um, one of them is about security. Um, it's from the folks at Columbus State and it's titled, Oh, and by the way, be secure. <laughs> and, the, and the other one is ideas from North Carolina. I am a CS teacher, PD, open source and artificial intelligence from our, one of our neighboring states. So two very interesting sounding panels. Um, stick around, go get a, a quick bite to eat, bathroom break, and we'll see you all back in five. Thank you again, Bye, Jerry. everyone. Thank you. Peace. And I think we are clear. All right, awesome. Jeremy. Thanks a lot. Um, are you, where are you located at? I'm in Colorado. In Colorado? Okay. okay. Yeah. Much, not not yeah, too different so I mean, today. It's a little chilly. Here. It's a little chilly in Georgia today, so not too different. Oh, is it? It's been pretty warm here. Um, yeah, the kids have been complaining that it's too hot to play outside. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's been in the 90s, but no humidity like there in Georgia, so. Yeah, well. Hopefully I can get back out to Colorado again soon. I've been a couple of times in the last year, but nice. no travel at all for work. Yeah. Like that, so. Yep. Well, next time you're here, let me know. You can swing by the office and see how the donuts are made. So. Yeah, I I, I love it. I I love all of the 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 granular aspects of the the development. So yeah, I will do. We're it. working on it. We're trying to make it better now with the the, I guess the merger with Little Bits. We've got kind of a broader portfolio of, of things we're doing. We actually just released a bit that allows you to use Microbit with little bits huh. um, to program it. So you can use make code now to program your little bits, which then you can connect to a Sphero Rover. So now you're actually programming Rover with make code and little bits all at once. You're creating, you know, these dynamic robots now that uh, you can cool. before. So that's what I need. Uh, we need some some open source robotics for the education space that allows you to sure. Take these different components that you have sitting on your shelves. I got a micro bit over here, but I have some little bits over here, and I have a Sphero, but I can do something that incorporates all of them, and, and I can see the connection between all the different um, components. So that'd be cool. That's what we're trying to do. We're just trying to help schools feel like they don't have to invest tens of thousands of dollars to get going, but they can actually use what they already have to at least get started, get teachers comfortable, get students comfortable. And then as they have a direction, then spend that money to support that direction. Yeah, and spend it smartly as opposed to just spending it wildly, which is yeah. much more effective. Yes, I agree. for sure. I agree. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna hop off real quick and come back to the session. Thank you tremendously. Pleasure, oh, appreciate it. Peace. Peace.